Closers, where business leaders share insights on how to build businesses from the ground up and best practices for innovating in their industry. Hey Mark, I'm so excited to sit down with you. Hey Sam, thanks for having me here. So you're an extremely accomplished man. Um, you had your own uh, business that you founded. You were the fourth employee at HubSpot. Um, you took the company from zero to 100. You've written a book on sales acceleration formula. You're also a professor at Harvard. So much uh, that you can be proud of. Well, what is one accomplishment that comes to mind that you you say that was that was? Ah, uh, yeah, um, yeah. I feel really blessed with how uh, like the last ten or twelve years have unfolded. A lot of amazing things have happened. You know, I would say, you know, people. I, I might reframe it to like, what do you miss most about HubSpot? Because this is actually one of my favorite things. Is like, I discovered how much leadership was around really personal, like people development, mm -hmm. and. You have, you have to fall into your own leadership style. And one thing that I just loved doing and I miss the most about you know, leading a team is you know, two, three months into a new employee's tenure, once they had kind of dropped some of the loyalty to their last company and had really started to embrace our culture, I'd ask them, why do you come to work every day? Mm -hmm. like, and in sales, how much you make is, can be very dynamic. So mm -hmm. like, let's say you made twice as much as your target commission what what why is that good for you what drives your that that effort and that that success mm -hmm. and you start hearing like you know i'm saving for an engagement ring i always dreamed of like running you know have investment properties my favorite one was one of our employees had a autistic child that was struggling mm -hmm. and he really wanted to get him a private school and so in all these cases we had an opportunity to like okay let's create a plan Right? Let's, let's talk about what you're doing today and let's get to those financial targets and achieve that goal. You know, people just don't have that connection and thought process and we, we accomplish a lot of those goals. That, that autistic child was in private school the next year. And to just like be a part of that, that's like the, for most of my employees when I see it, the people I hired, when I see them now, I can remember what they told me. Mm. And I remember I saw a woman last week at him, I'm like, did you start that VC firm yet? And they're just, that's, that's what I like to know about folks, and I like to, I miss helping them achieve those things. Awesome, that's good, good to hear. You built a sales team in a marketing tech company, and, yeah. and tell me a little bit about how, how did you get to actually get those two organizations Oof. to work together? That's become such an important question these days, you know, because, you know, we, because we were, you know, I was running sales in a marketing team, so I got to go and counsel a lot of heads of sales and heads of marketing, and Traditionally, those departments hate each other. Mm. They're just like, you know, marketers think salespeople are overpaid, spoiled brats, mm. and salespeople think marketers do arts, crafts, arts and crafts all day and like don't do real work. Mm -hmm. And that was fine in like the 90s pre internet. Now, almost all buying journeys start in an area that's owned by marketing, mm. like the website or email or social, and they progress to an area that's owned by sales. Mm -hmm. So, not aligning them, buyers can feel that. Mm. And aligning them, buyers can feel that. And that's a huge competitive advantage. So I was fortunate to have my, my you know, partner there, Mike Volpe, our CMO through the IPO journey. Um, he was also an MIT grad. We were sort of cut from the same thread per se and weren't enemies. Mm. You know, we, were, we, were, we wanted to jointly solve this. So it's all the basic blocking and tapping that you hear about today that we did. Just sat down. And, and you know, still companies are confused on this and, and this adds a lot of value. You literally get the CEO, head of sales, head of marketing, you know, maybe even head of product together and say like, what is, what is a lead? Mm -hmm. What's an MQL? What counts? And let's be really, like use LinkedIn or whatever, use Discover.org as your sort of like system of record. And like, mm -hmm. if it has this many employees, this much revenue, that is a lead. Mm -hmm. No complaining from sales if you get that. Mm -hmm. That's not good. You can, you can disqualify them. Mm -hmm. That is a lead. Marketing mm -hmm. did their job. And, and so we steered away from like the intense lead score. I, mm -hmm. I think like you end up with 50 permutations, it gets a little intense. Mm -hmm. We really just looked at like three categories of whether the company was a good fit and three categories of engagement, mm -hmm. an A, B, or C and put a dollar figure against it. Mm. And that allowed us to essentially put marketing on a dollar, a revenue quota every month that we measure daily. Mm. Um, and then sales had their job, call it within 10 minutes, call it six times over two weeks, like, and we measure that. Mm. So it was like, it, 
because we did it from the beginning and because we educated the employee base on the importance of this, it wasn't perceived as sort of a micromanagement. It was like, this is the heartbeat of our organization. Mm -hmm. We're gonna measure it every day and we're gonna tell everyone where we're at. And when we have issues, we're gonna work together to solve them. Mm. So I have a follow-up question. So basically, you know, for you to even come to the, the realization of those, some of those metrics that you wanted to measure, did you have some prior experience in sales when you when you got to those? Okay, these are some of the metrics that I should be measuring to see. Prior before HubSpot or yeah, yeah. during HubSpot? Yeah. Not really. Okay. You know, it was like, um, I was really an entrepreneur. At 23, mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I was in my first startup, I'm like, this is heaven. And I never looked back. Mm -hmm. And I went to MIT at some point during that journey to study the craft in the business program and started a company when I was there. I knew functionally I wanted a contribution to the entrepreneurial ecosystem. I started my career coding and I, it wasn't my biggest passion. Mm -hmm. So it was really going to be sales and marketing. And I kind of let fate take its course a bit. I love the marketing for the data driven part and I love sales because of the revenue part. Mm -hmm. And you know, HubSpot kind of fell on my lap and Halligan was like, do sales for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's, it actually ended up being such a blessing because I was doing sales in a very innovative marketing company. So mm -hmm. I got to really express both muscles. Mm -hmm. um, so other than that, like, I mean, one summer I sold vacuum cleaners. One summer I raised money for the American Heart Association over the phone. So I had little experiences <laughs> that added up, but it was really just self-educating myself through the process. Makes sense. And then you just kind of figured out what are some of the key metrics. I mean, you're an engineer by profession, mm -hmm. so you were data-driven to begin with. But you, you kind of came up with some metrics in terms of these are the leading indicators and lag measures yes. that I needed to measure to see the ultimate goal, which is revenue. Yeah, I mean, it's a combination of things. Number one, I was really blessed to accidentally fall into the world of sales at a time where my background strengths were uniquely advantageous. Mm -hmm. Prior to around 2006, 2007, a lot of sales teams were outside, mm -hmm. field teams, and CRM adoption was abysmal. You had no data. But then right around when we were doing it, we, I think we kind of contributed to this revolution as did many companies, inside sales became super popular. And there was no problem getting inside reps to use the CRM, mm -hmm. at least at a basic level. So all of a sudden, you had lots of data. Mm -hmm. And it was like kind of a clean inventive slate. It was like, what do we do with this? Mm -hmm. And that's where like my background as an engineer was exciting because I could see sort of the outputs that I wanted, we wanted great customer attention, we wanted great revenue, but like as a company, you can't be measuring your, your success based on your quarterly revenue mm -hmm. outcomes. That's such a lagging indicator mm -hmm. to behavior that you did six to nine months prior. Mm -hmm. So I came extremely obsessive with what are the lead indicators we can measure to, to understand a true heartbeat of what our organization looks like today mm -hmm. so we can decide whether to go faster or slower. So obviously you've been in the sales space over you know, 10 plus years now, you've you exited a, a massive company um, and now you're, uh, you're an entrepreneur, you're doing your own venture capital and you also mm. are a professor, you're teaching. What are some bad recommendations that you hear about sales and marketing that you commonly hear professionals giving to Yeah, others? I think the biggest one right now, which is a big part of my work at Stage 2 Capital, um, I teach on this concept and probably the, like a cornerstone theme of like uh, my next book is bringing a lot more science to understanding when to scale and how fast. Mm -hmm. Are we scaling too fast or too slow? Because I think that we, we as an entrepreneur community um, have learned a lot from the work of Eric Reese with Lean Startup and mm -hmm. Steve Blank around like MVPs and prototyping and involving customers through the product development journey and not like hiring 10 reps when we only have an idea and product market fit. All that stuff has made entrepreneurs more successful. Mm -hmm. But I think I see time and time again, both the entrepreneur and the investor, you know, they're like, oh, we have product market fit. We have five customers. They're happy. Mm -hmm. The product works. Let's add 10 reps next month and start being a unicorn. Mm -hmm. And there's just a lot of stuff that needs to happen between that moment of adding 10 reps a month mm -hmm. um, for you to be ready. And I think there's an extremely poor understanding of what those are. And that's really what a lot of my work has been is helping to create a framework around that. Mm -hmm. And it's not really advocating, you know, growing slower. It's just growing smarter in the right way, in mm -hmm. the right steps. Like at the end of the year, you hopefully would end up in the same spot. It's just the likelihood is much uh, a higher success because there's, there's known, you know, benchmarks you're trying to achieve. And I think you call that premature growth or something yeah, like that? Yeah, okay. exactly. I would say summarize 
the biggest issue is premature revenue growth. Mm -hmm. yeah. So instead of just jumping into uh, adding more reps to, to scale fast, you kind of have to not just have the product market fit, but you call it um, the, there's a- Go-to-market go fit to market as well. Fit. So was, I kind of have an enhanced definition of product market fit, which is not just five customers that mm -hmm. like it, but that you can bring on every month or every quarter, a handful of customers, and within the first 60 or 90 days, they're actually realizing the value you promised them. Mm -hmm. Most people don't even measure that. And a lot of companies actually go public before they even mm -hmm. do that, arguably Groupon maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so that is just such an important foundation to have and that's the true product market fit. Mm -hmm. And then go to market fit is really just doing that profitably. Mm -hmm. Do you have a demand gen channel you can lean in? Do you have a sales playbook? Um, does your comp plan and pricing model and quota all match up to strong unit economics? Mm -hmm. Let, we, ha we need that in place before we add 10 or 20 reps. Mm -hmm. And that, these things could take two months to do. Mm. And then you're ready. And when you scale, you don't add 20 reps tomorrow. You add one a month and watch it for six months to see if those things break. If they break, go slower. If they're doing well, go faster. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot, a, a much more formulaic approach to when to scale and how fast. So, I mean, and then, then comes the question of the training aspect of it, right? Like a lot of times these companies are hiring like 20 guys, training them all at once. Let them all go hit the road running and then see which one you know, yeah. succeeds. Half of them fail, half of them succeed, maybe if you're lucky. Yeah, and I know it's a big, you know, like burning through cash just by doing yeah. that. But right. also then you're, the other side of it is hiring one at a time, but then you're, you're waiting a very long time to build up that sales team as well, right? So what yeah. advice do you have in terms of kind of balancing that? Well, I mean, hiring one a month is cooking. Hmm. You know, or like hire two or three a quarter. It doesn't have to be, you know, you can do two or three in January, two or three in March. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you're still cooking if you, if you do that. You're still gonna be in like double or triple in revenue. Mm. It's just the advantage there is you're learning, mm. right? Like first off, you don't have the demand gen to all of a sudden one month support mm -hmm. that many more reps. So you're, you're slowly learning your demand gen, you're increasing it to be in line with your sales capacity. Mm -hmm. And then you're also like, if you hire three reps in Q1 and two don't work out, you can build all those learnings into your future hires. Mm -hmm. Versus if you hire 10 or 15 right now, you, you, know, all, you, know, you, just, you make your mistakes that much more exponential. Do you have a favorite HubSpot story that comes to mind? Oof, there's a bunch, there's mm -hmm. a bunch. Since Caputo put us together, um, I'll, I'll lean on him. He was actually one of the first people that I pitched HubSpot on, hmm. right? So when I, I started as a, it was just Brian and Darmesh and I was like a consultant to them. There was, there was like, hey, go talk to customers, find out if this thing works. And at the time, the vision for HubSpot, this is way back, mm -hmm. 06, it wasn't around sales and marketing. It was around uh, an aggregation of everything a small business needs, like a, an extranet, an intranet, like an internal company blog, like all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, my dad was actually a sales coach. He was coaching Caputo, who was running a consulting company. And, uh, I, list, I pitched Pete and he's like, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Mm. And uh, I said, why? He's like, all small business owners care about is getting customers. Mm -hmm. And they don't care about an intranet and like all this kind of stuff. So I went back to Halligan and Darmesh the next day. They're sitting around and Halligan was like, hmm. And he got up on the, on the board, he drew a funnel mm -hmm. and Darmesh was taking notes and every, all the stuff was around the funnel. I mean, mm -hmm. everyone has different stories of what influenced things, but that was my remembrance of it. And you know, that was a big pivot for mm -hmm. HubSpot. And it's funny that Caputa, who was a stranger to me, you know, a year later we ended up hiring him and he ends up building the partner program. That's how we got introduced. Mm -hmm. And you know, he ends up joining a company and, and contributing so much to the success for something that he thought was the dumbest idea ever. So, yeah, and almost yeah. the company is a completely different yeah. company today because otherwise, the, the way I remember HubSpot when I was introduced to it way back in the days, like 2006 or seven, yeah. was like a CMS system almost. That was yes, what it was. exactly. And now it, it is almost a hub, right? It has, it runs, it's got the sales hub, the service totally. hub, the marketing hub, a whole lot of other stuff added to it. And I think- Yeah, that's the thing that I've learned greatly from Halligan is he's always paranoid about what's next. Mm -hmm. There's never like, it's good enough. Mm. It's always like, hey, I'm, I'm liking the success, but I'm also freaking out because I'm paranoid about the future. Mm. And he's always reinventing. I mean, mm. they've, they've moved right away from inbound to growth, mm. and that was a brilliant move. Mm -hmm. um, adding the CRM and services as opposed to going aggressively upstream. Like, he was getting myself, Volpe, our CFO, the board, the analysts on the street were all saying, you're foolish, go upstream. And he and Darmesh were like, no, we're going sideways and stay in SMB. Mm. And that was a brilliant move. So mm. yeah, I've learned a lot from him on, on 
you know, uh, disrupting yourself, I suppose. Mm, yeah, and I think that move has been extremely effective for, Huge. and it, it, it shows up on the stock. Yeah, I mean, it really, it's, I think, a huge part of his transition to a, a, just one of the best public company CEOs, which yeah, is great. most certainly. So tell me a little bit about stage two capital. What are some of the things that you look at before you invest in a company and what are some things like, hey, this, is, this isn't this is for us? Like what yeah, are some of the key factors sure. that you look in uh, a company? So just, re yeah, real quick, the, the premise behind stage two. I was, uh, since leaving HubSpot, I've just committed my life to helping entrepreneurs through mm -hmm. the perspective of revenue. That's what led to, you know, HBS asked me to join in the faculty and build a sales course. That fits that box beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, and I was helping one company a quarter and then I met a, a gentleman at Bessemer who was like, listen, the world of investing needs a venture capital firm that's run and backed by sales and marketing professionals. Hmm. And because there's just not the quality of advice at the board level that to help these, these founders with these critical decisions. And I was like, I know, I'm in those <laughs> meetings and you're right, they're venture capitalists traditionally are extremely smart with finance, product, strategy. There isn't really a lot of experience on the sales and marketing side. Hmm. So I'm like, Here's my Rolodex, if you can get the money, we'll do it. Mm. And he got a hundred heads of sales and marketing from all the top software companies to write us, you know, pretty good checks and, and start making investments. Mm. So we're talking like the folks from Salesforce and Atlassian and Dropbox and HubSpot and Drift and Asana and LinkedIn, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just been great. And, um, and now we're, you know, we've made eight, eight going on nine investments. Mm -hmm. And that's really where we come in is like when they're starting to set up the sales and marketing team, mm -hmm. right? So the thing we look for is I do believe, and it's consistent with our prior conversation, most entrepreneurs, and I fell into this, this, this pothole, most entrepreneurs and investors are overly focused on revenue growth mm -hmm. <laughs> in the early stages and under focused on customer value creation. Mm. Right, like think about it. You like go talk to an entrepreneur. First thing they tell you, their revenue and how fast you're growing. Mm. Investor, first question they ask, revenue and how fast you're growing. Mm. That's the first deck, the first slide on the board deck, mm -hmm. financials. But where is the customer retention? Where's the leading indicators to mm -hmm. customer retention? How often they're using your product? How quickly they on board? In my opinion, those are much more important metrics in the zero to two million dollar journey mm -hmm. than like honestly revenue growth. And I'd much rather invest in a company that has average revenue growth, but phenomenal customer mm -hmm. success creation than a company that has amazing revenue growth, but is struggling with customer success. Mm -hmm. And I don't think a lot of investors and entrepreneurs look at that stage through that lens. So this is why I think you're considering the product market fit is to be a lot longer exactly. of a phase than just, hey, I have a product people wants to buy. Yeah, it's great. You have five customers, they use it. Next step, in my opinion, is Let's define what that leading indicator of success is. Mm -hmm. That like, if you get someone to do this in the first 60 days, they're gonna be a great customer. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, they're gonna be at risk. Mm -hmm. That's different for every company. Let's define that, let's start acquiring customers, and let's see if we can get 70 to 80% mm -hmm. to hit that. Mm -hmm. If you can do that, I'm very excited about the business we're gonna build together. Yeah, this is where I think HubSpot was using the cheese score and things of yeah. that nature to really monitor who's actually actively engaging and what, which of the HubSpot tool sets were they, were they using. And if they yeah. were not, I guess the client's customer, customer success team were actively looking at those accounts and saying, maybe I need to reach out to those guys because there's a possibility of We are obsessed with this. Yeah. And it changed our company for the better, right? So ours, our leading indicator was, at the time we had 20 features in mm -hmm. the platform, right? The, social media, email, the CMS, the CRM, mm -hmm. the nurturing, all that stuff. If the customer used five or more in the first 60 days, they were gonna be a customer for life. Mm -hmm. If they didn't, they were at risk. Mm -hmm. And that was aligned with our unique value prop. Mm -hmm. If you just wanted social media, you'd go okay. to Hootsuite. Yeah. If you just wanted a, a CMS, you'd get WordPress. Mm -hmm. And we weren't gonna compete on that point feature. Where we were differentiated was the integrations. Mm -hmm. So that was a brilliant, a beautiful, lead indicator of success. And then it was game changing if we start comping our reps mm -hmm. on that moment, if we start comping our, measuring our, our customer success managers on mm -hmm. that moment, it's so much easier for a 25 year old customer success manager to conceptualize getting their customer using five features than to conceptualize getting their churn rate mm. lower than 10% a year. Yeah. Right, so it's just game changing for our company. Yeah, so they have a focus in terms of what I need this customer to be successful at and, exactly. and they're helping them uh, maximize right. the tools that they invest in. All about leading indicators, right? Most so. certainly. Uh, in your book, Sales Acceleration Formula, you talk a lot about sales training, you know, um, you know, metrics driven sales coaching, things of that nature. 
right? So as entrepreneurs and business leaders, when we hire salespeople, we want them to be extremely productive very, very fast. And, uh, and I think we do it at the expense of coaching and training because we just want them on the phone or uh, in front of prospects. So how do you balance that, the training and coaching, and then also allowing them to, to have the time in prospecting and sitting in front of you know, prospective customers and doing those things yeah, in I a mean, smaller organization? It especially. doesn't take that much time. You know what I mean? What we essentially did or what I did to, to keep a proactive coaching culture is on the first day of the month, all of my managers had an hour one-on-one -on -one with each rep. Mm. And they asked the rep how they did qualitatively, what they wanted to work on qualitatively, and then went through the rep's numbers mm -hmm. and had the rep reflect on each of their activity metrics and how they're doing relative to the blueprint. Mm -hmm. okay? And through that conversation, the rep essentially devised their own coaching plan for the month. Mm -hmm. It could be like, like we were talking, let's work on sense of urgency development. Mm -hmm. okay? So that could be a rep's improvement area. And then the manager would say, okay, how would you like my help? And the rep would just say, hey, why don't I record two or three calls mm -hmm. and we'll set some time to go through them. And, and in that meeting, they're like, okay, great. Uh, we're both free next Monday at three and we're both, can you stay late the following Wednesday at six and we'll mm -hmm. get together. Mm -hmm. And so we book those two calls. They show up Monday at three. Now, if, if they book in a great meeting, then we'll, we'll, we'll move it, but mm -hmm. we'll move it. Mm -hmm. We'll move it so we know we're going to have the coaching. And you know, if you have two or three one hour sessions of listening to film and having your, your manager coach you on sense of urgency, you're gonna get a lot better in that month. Mm -hmm. And that was three hours out of a, what, a, a 200 hour a month. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like 2%, you know, 2% of your, of your time. time yeah. so, so that it's just really getting off the hamster wheel of always being reactive to chasing quota mm -hmm. and having a proactive approach to diagnosing, creating a coaching plan and executing on it. Makes sense. So when, from an organizational structure standpoint, especially when you're talking to a smaller organization, I mean, companies that are, you know, have, you know, five to ten employees, they may have, you know, sales people, they might have the sales manager and the VP of sales, things of that nature. But how do you, how do you properly structure for a smaller organization? How do you make sure, because I think sometimes, you know, the person who's also the manager is also having a, is a quota carrying sales rep and it's not always the healthy thing. Yeah, I don't like that. So what, what, what <laughs> There's is, a lot of data that shows that that's you know, the team lead, you know, mm -hmm. a lot, of, I can understand why the CEOs and founders want to do that. It's mm -hmm. hard to take if, you know, Samuel, if you were the best rep mm -hmm. and we know you're going to be the best manager, it's hard to start losing your quota. Mm -hmm. But if I say, hey, take half quota and coach these people, it's just really hard to switch between those over a long time. For mm -hmm. two or three months, fine. Mm -hmm. So I just, I think the team lead concept, half quota, half manager, is a, is a big trap that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So at what, at what size would you say you need to have a, a actual sales manager is required? Um, probably like four or five reps. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you need to have identified who that is. I mean, maybe the founder can handle it for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, maybe that person can still carry a bag for a bit and then bring those. But hiring, if you're going to go to like six or eight reps over the course of the year, it's just a lot of work to be half the time interviewing and hiring. Mm -hmm. You got to onboard them then you're going to manage them and coach them it's just it's a, it's a good 60 time. 80 hour a week Makes you know sense. what i mean so so you probably want to do it at like three or four reps how has your outlook on sales uh, has changed over the years um, obviously you've built a sales team took it from zero to 100 million and yeah. took the company public um, now you've written books and teaching about it at harvard yeah. so how has that uh, outlook changed over the years yeah i mean i think mm, these are related points the two that came to mind is number one that sales is more about customer value creation than it is about getting customers and revenue. Mm -hmm. Like I think if you, if you survey at CEOs, like what's the, what's the objective of your sales team? They would say acquire customers, mm -hmm. like hit the revenue new, goal. New, new logos. Right? And it, you know, it's been surprising as I've, as I've like helped many organizations with their go-to-market design, mm -hmm. some of which is like improving customer retention the source of customer retention issues is more often in sales. Hmm. It's more often like who they're selling and the expectations they're setting. So that's been a huge switch for me is how do you build a team that's not just gonna go hit your quota, but gonna hit them with very healthy customers that have appropriate expectations. Mm -hmm. right? And I think it's related to just this, something we talk about a lot was like, how much more empowered buyers are by the internet, how much more information they have, and the impact that that has on how to sell. Mm -hmm. And so those are aligned, um, that you, you have to be focused on customer value creation um, because of the health of the business, but also because of the modern buyer 
and how, how empowered they are. Would that affect the actual quota size? And also, what about the length of sales? Because when you're talking about creating value, mm -hmm. that means a lot longer conversation. The sales cycle might be even mm -hmm. lengthened. So it could you, be. It mm -hmm. could be. I mean, I haven't seen it as much. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, when you do get focused, you're, sometimes the close rate can drop a little bit because mm -hmm. you're bringing on healthier stuff. But if you look at it not as a cost of customer acquisition, but you look at it as a cost of lifetime value, mm -hmm. that actually ends up proving. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, you don't want to just focus on the close rate or the CAC mm -hmm. because it, you're really trying to focus on long-term profits. Mm -hmm. um, and so that usually um, would grow. And then furthermore, it's like, it's sort of an analog to like, well, I could do all this discovery mm -hmm. and ask all these questions, but it's just faster if I just tell a customer what we do mm -hmm. and then they decide to buy. Yeah. It's actually not mm -hmm. like we've we've known in sales for decades that if you take the time to understand their context and understand whether you should spend time with them mm -hmm. and if you do spend time to spend it tailor the con the things actually move faster yeah. Yeah. and it's the same with this customer value creation mm -hmm. and it's a big paradigm shift from what I can tell like I think like you yeah. said like the founders are extremely focused on growth and the totally. investors are also extremely focused on the growth side of it but then, you know, like, hey man, we're, we're gonna really focus on making sure that we're creating value for our customer yes. more than just we're adding more new logos. Uh, that's a different different way of looking at the overall growth strategy. Yeah, yeah. cool. Most certainly. Yeah. So if you can go back to yourself at HubSpot the day you started and provide some advice from your future, what would be one thing that you tell yourself? Enjoy the ride a bit more. I mean, it was super stressful. Um, and uh, people are like, oh, you must, they'd hear about the press. I'm like, you must be having so much fun. And like, well, you did have, we had moments to smell the roses. I, well, I should have taken more. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it would have, yeah, it was a great experience of no regrets, but I think it would have like, you know, it was a big chunk of my life, 10 mm -hmm. years. And, you know, I think I could have appreciated that more through the journey. Um, I think the other thing that's really, it's been a little bit of more of like a spiritual thing for me is just like, I was externally calculated as a, you know, engineer and programmer very goals driven and analytical and everything that I need to do. And now I've, you know, become a lot more just perceptive to listening to what's happening around me in my life and mm -hmm. letting those things alter. It's, a, it's just a reflection that I've made in terms of like, I didn't mean to go to HubSpot. I didn't mean to get into sales. I didn't pursue going to HBS. I didn't even pursue writing a book. And I didn't pursue starting a venture capital firm. Mm -hmm. the, all these things came from people that landed in my life serendipitously and because I approached them with an open mind they led to amazing life experiences mm. and at a 20 as a 20 something I didn't have that openness mm. so that that's probably been a big shift for me obviously the technology has changed the way you do sales and marketing today and do you think we're gonna get to a place where we're not gonna need a lot of salespeople on the other end of the phone and that we're gonna be making purchases yeah I've been really having a lot of people are asking me that about like AI and machine learning not I don't like if you think about all the professions <laughs> that are up for disruption. I, you know, I'm obviously a bit biased in it, but I, I don't see sales, a particular type of sales. That's mm -hmm. the type of sales we're talking about. Uh, of course, like telemarketing has been significantly disrupted by things like e-commerce and mm -hmm. email and all that kind of stuff. Show up and throw up type selling that mm -hmm. aren't high, they're not high IQ will, I think, get disrupted. But this deep, like psychological type of selling of like really partnering with a, with a, a leader mm -hmm. to understand and frame their business, their opportunities and the challenges that they're having and, and match those against solutions, that, that's gonna be a while mm -hmm. before AI can solve it, so. Makes sense. And also, do you, do you see that there, there's still an effective way to do outbound sales um, without really? Absolutely. You believe so? <laughs> how, 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 how? Yeah, I mean, that was always a tension because like, it's literally the first Harvard case about HubSpot was Being one, bad. this is one of the pieces mm -hmm. was I was telling Brian and Dharmesh, I really need to stand up a cold calling team to diversify our demand gen away from strictly inbound. Mm -hmm. And they were like, that's impossible. We've been on Time Magazine saying that cold calling is dead. That would mm -hmm. be so contradictory. But I just needed a backup plan. Mm -hmm. And we made it work. I mean, it wasn't as profitable as the inbound leads, but mm -hmm. it was profitable. So it was a, it was a, um, it was a, uh, a driver for us. Mm -hmm. And it, it, all these demand gen, they come, you do this work a lot. Um, 
it all comes down to who your buyer is and what your product is, mm -hmm. right? So we were looking at an investment this summer in a, a company that sells to like really blue collar manufacturing companies. Mm -hmm. They're just not, they're not the sitting online. online all day like say an engineer or a marketer, mm -hmm. okay? Um, they have a phone still. Mm -hmm. They actually use it quite a bit. Um, Outbound is going to be great for them. Mm -hmm. All right, it's a you know so so the, you really have to match. It's like marketing one hundred and one. You've got to understand your target buyer and their behaviors and match it with the right medium. Mm -hmm. So you believe still that if you properly utilize yes. some of these other old old tactics, you can yes. still be effective I think in the, terms of the creating. breakthrough in outbound that I see that a lot of people aren't leveraging is. Um, to make the pitch less about hearing about your product mm -hmm. and more about some sort of a value adding assessment, mm -hmm. right? So an example might be like, listen, we, we, work, you know, we work with you know, dozens of companies every quarter of your peers. Mm -hmm. We get to see an insider view of their operation. If you'd like, if you wanted to spend 20 minutes on the phone and elaborate on some of your operational metrics, I can compare those to what we're seeing amongst your peers and help you understand where you're beating the market and where you're where we're lacking mm -hmm. and some of the techniques that your peers are using to enhance that. That's not a pitch to, to close a product, but mm -hmm. that's hugely value. And to literally brand it, not the, a discovery call, but to brand it some sort of assessment. Mm -hmm. That's an area that's working quite well and not enough companies are leaning into. Is that kind of like the, the challenger sales methodology leading with insight? A little bit, but mm -hmm. it's more like you're pitching on it. Like mm -hmm. I think the I love the challenger mindset, but it's more like, Companies like you are focused on these types of things and mm -hmm. you're trying to push the perception based on just making them aware of it through a statement. Mm -hmm. And this is more about selling a benchmarking assessment mm -hmm. that they can then use to influence perception. So it's, it's similar, but there's not as much in the challenger sale on the, on the selling of that meeting. Makes sense. So it's most like getting that assessment by creating a value for yes. why they should even invest the time to do so. Yes. Obviously, you got a lot going on. You're speaking, you're, you're teaching, you're still, you know, you have the private equity firm, there's so much going on. Are there any productivity hacks that really worked for you that you would advise to other entrepreneurs? Um, I'm really, uh, I spend a lot more time than you think on my time management. Mm -hmm. um, on the 15th of every month, I look ahead to the next two months and mm -hmm. I lay out every hour of my calendar. Mm -hmm. The first thing I do is I lay out how, when I'm picking my kids up at school and helping them with homework, which is quite a bit. Mm -hmm. The second thing I lay out is when I'm working out every day. The third thing I lay out is my teaching commitments. And then I lay out my calls for like venture capital firms and roll that all into this master time trade with, mm. with the help of my personal assistant. So I'm extraordinarily calculating how I use my time wow. and you know how much, as I look at the next two months of my life, what I want those various buckets to be mm -hmm. um, and, and proactive about doing it. Otherwise, one of those buckets is gonna dominate in a way that you don't want it to. So. That's, that's so my just time is, is that all on a, like a special app? or? Is yeah, I have like a list that I go through in order. Mm -hmm. I, then I put it into, in blocks in my Outlook calendar. My personal assistant has different time trade blocks that mm. she, he, he, she, he can then put. It's actually a group of people, so I say he or mm -hmm. she. Like they can put it in a, and then distribute it to you know, my, my assistant at HBS for my office hours, mm -hmm. to my co-founder on, on the VC side to help with those types of meetings. and. So there's a whole system mm. uh, to, to drive all that. That's crazy. There's probably a, a good long blog that you yeah, can Yeah, I could about. actually. Yeah, <laughs> it might be cool. awesome to, to see some of those tactics that you have. Yeah. Some closing questions here. If you had an opportunity um, to sit down with a Warren Buffett for an afternoon or a million dollars in exchange for that time, which would mm. you do? What's that? Which would you choose? No, what's the second one? Uh, you had a million dollars or an opportunity to have a lunch or Ooh, uh, a, 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 a walk with Warren Buffett. Oh my Buffett. gosh, that's a hard <laughs> choice. There's just a lot of like social impact that I've been focused on, which is intriguing by the million dollars. Mm. As much as I'd want to hear what Warren Buffett. It's Bill.com or Bill.org is Bill.org yeah, is a yeah. big one. All the book proceeds go there. But as much as I'd want to hear from Warren Buffett what his view on the next 10 years are, because that would be <laughs> life changing, I think I'd do a lot of good with the million dollars. Um, in and then terms tell them, like, hey, I just, yeah, I just exactly. gave all that million. Maybe, you give yeah, maybe time? I can do that, right. <laughs> Any closing and parting wisdom for our audience? No, just thanks for the opportunity. And, um, you know, it's congrats on all your success and good luck to the audience. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate you sitting down with yeah, me. Yeah, you bet, Samuel. Yeah. This episode of Coffee with Closers is brought to you by One IMS, a leading digital marketing agency helping businesses win new customers. To request a free marketing ROI audit, please visit 
oneims.com. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. To make sure you never miss an episode, please subscribe.